It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Walgreen, who is going to give this talk on satisfiability and synthesis modular oracles and this joint work with Andy Reynolds and Sandrit Sesia. So the floor is yours, Elizabeth. Great, thanks. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as you said, this is joint work with Andrew Reynolds and Sanjit Sesha, um, and I'm pretty excited to tell you about it. But uh, first, I'm going to tell you about maybe a slightly silly synthesis problem. So suppose I've got two pictures of cats, um, and I want to know what the function is that transforms cat A into cat B. Can I use program synthesis for this? So initially looking at this, there's one obvious problem. F here is complicated. It needs to load a JPEG image. It needs to apply the transformation to all the pixels. And then it needs to output a new image. So obviously, that's a bit beyond like the kind of formal synthesis that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm thinking, when I say synthesis, I'm thinking syntax-guided synthesis. Um, but OK, I'm willing to provide some infrastructure for this problem. I'm willing to say, um, OK, I will provide the infrastructure that loads the image. I will compile the function you give me. I will execute it on, or on the image, and then I will output the image. So then I want to say, OK, can I use program synthesis now? Um, and I'm a bit closer, but the problem now is that my synthesizer, in order to tell whether a function is correct, it still needs to be able to load the image in order to be able to sort of diff the pixels and like compare, Im compare image B to image A. So I'm still not quite there. Um, so what if I do all of that? What if I do all of the extracting pixel values for the synthesizer? So I try and give the synthesizer all of these input output constraints over all of the pixels uh, in this image. Um, so I pull for every pixel. I say, OK, this pixel t value turns into this pixel value and so on. Now, can I use program synthesis? Um, well, I tried this. Um, and in theory, yes. In practice, there are simply far too many constraints here. There's more than 65,000 constraints, and um, CVC5, which is the state-of-the-art syntax-guided synthesis solver, can't handle it. And there's another problem here, that when I do this, when I construct my synthesis problem like this, I'm assuming that my compiler is bug-free. So my synthesis function is only correct if my compiler is correct. Um, so do I need to build a new solver if I want to if I want to synthesize the function that goes from cat A to cat B? Well, I, spoiler, I'm going to tell you that by the time we've got to the end of this talk and you know what synthesis modulo oracles is, you won't need to build a new solver. But right now, yes, I do. But I, know, I also want to give you a slightly more heavyweight example because the cats are a little bit silly. So suppose I want to synthesize a controller for a linear time invariant system. And the controller must stabilize my system so that the eigenvalues fall into a unit circle and the system must stay safe. So if you're not familiar with control, the only thing you need to know is that this involves some nonlinear matrix operations. And I want to do this with program synthesis. Can I? Well, in theory, yes. In practice, uh, so we tried this, and um, asking asking a sort of syntax guided synthesizer that relies on SMT solvers to find eigenvalues is not likely to be very successful. So, do I need to build a new solver? Well, I mean, yes, yes, you do. I did. I mean, in fact, I actually did. So this, I took this example from some work we did um, a number of years ago, and it was published at CAV. We had to build a synthesizer for exactly the reason I've described to you, and our synthesizer had multiple verification stages. So, OK, so I've given you two synthesis examples where I'm going to argue that oracles are useful. Let's um, step back a little bit, and let's now look at SMT. Um, here I am doing my maths homework. Um, my maths homework involves finding the prime factors of a number. I'm very lazy. This looks to me like an SMT problem. So I decide I'm just going to chuck my maths homework into an SMT solver. Does this work? Well, I mean, no, no, it doesn't. Not yet anyway. And the reason it doesn't is because is prime is a recursive function. If you want to reason about something like whether a number is prime, you need to build a recursive function in SMT. And SMT solvers aren't great at it. So do I need to build a new solver for this? 
yeah, probably. Or I could do my maths homework the hard way. So I've shown you three examples where you can't use the off the shelf solver to solve the problem. Uh, why can't you? Um, well, there's, I've picked out three reasons. So the first is there are parts that are hard to model with static constraints. So the image processing library, the compiler, we can't build those constraints. The second is there are parts that um, solvers find hard to reason about, eigenvalues, primes, recursive functions. And the final reason is sometimes we just don't know which constraints are important. There are too many and we don't know which ones we should give to the solver. So which pixels matter in the cat, things like that. So we overwhelm the solver by giving the solver all the constraints before we start solving. And what I'm gonna tell you about in the next sort of 25 minutes is that we can address this by using executable oracles. And I mean, giving you a bit of a hint of what's gonna come up. So I'm gonna talk about how we use oracles in existing work. I'm gonna tell you how we've defined the interfaces that now let oracles in our work interact with solvers. I'm gonna define the problem of SMT with oracles, SMTO and synthesis with oracles, SIMO. There'll be some more cat pictures and there'll be a small prototype evaluation. Um, but I've used the, or the word oracle a lot and I haven't actually told you what I mean. So an oracle is something that you can query and it will give an answer. And the way you query the, or query the oracle is predefined and the set of possible answers it can give is predefined. And these are used a lot in existing synthesis algorithms. So there's a paper by Jar and Sesha that sets out the theory behind this and says, look, all of these synthesis algorithms are Oracle guided synthesis. This is the query and response frameworks they're using. Our contribution on top of that paper is to define this general problem, modulo oracles, and propose a unifying algorithm that allows you to solve a synthesis modulo oracles problem without writing a custom algorithm for it. But to reinforce that all synthesis algorithms use oracles, like the classic counterexample guided inductive synthesis, this is oracle guided synthesis. So our oracle here is the verifier. Our query is, is my program correct? And the answer it gives you is like the counterexample. That's the response. No, it's wrong. It was wrong on input seven. So like classic CGIS is oracle guided synthesis. And when we go beyond CGIS, often the way we go beyond it is by changing the oracles. So we had a bit of work at CAV a few years ago where we replaced the counterexample oracle with an oracle that can use a theory solver and can sort of re reason about the constants in your program. And one of the classic algorithms for invariant synthesis is ICE learning. And instead of just having a single counterexample oracle in ICE learning, they have three oracles they have a positive example oracle, they have a negative example oracle, and they have one that they call an implication query. So it says things like, oh, if state X is in your, is in your invariant, then X prime must also be in your invariant. So these are, these are classic ways of extending synthesis. I also want to point to some like really practical and clever uses of oracles out there in program lifting. So there's recent work by Colley et al, which uses um, oracles that execute. So you're synthesizing a summary of a black box and the oracles execute the black box and they look at which memory locations they access or they look at the runtime complexity. Um, so there's some really cool use of oracles out there. But every time someone's done it, they've built their own custom solver. And then why have they done that? Do they just really like building solvers? Is that, what, is that what's happening here? I mean, no, it's not. The reason they've built their own custom solver is because when you have a new Oracle, your solver needs custom information about it in order to use it. It needs to know what does the response from the Oracle mean? And... What I'm going to show you in this talk is I'm going to show you how we can communicate this information to a unifying algorithm, to a standard solver, so that in future, if you're like, hey, I've got this oracle, it looks at memory accesses, you can then, you don't need to build the whole synthesis algorithm, you just need to build the oracle. So 
I'm going to like the Oracle interfaces is how we're going to do that communication. Um, so I'm going to start there. So when we have this Oracle and we define this interface, the first thing we need to define is the query domain and the response codomain. So these are sorted variables. This is me saying like, this is what the input types are. This is what the return type is. That's quite straightforward. And then in order to say, in order to tell the solver, like, what does the response mean? This is where we use an assumption generator and a constraint generator. And this is one of the key bits of this work. So an assumption generator is a formula that you, and, and a constraint generator is a formula that where you insert the values from the query and the response. And this generates assumptions the solver is allowed to make or constraints the solver must abide by. And I'm going to explain this with an, an example rather than going further into it. So if we go back to my maths homework, um, I, again, I'm looking for prime numbers and I've got this Oracle with an assumption generator, prime Y equals Z. And I've got this formula that has the symbol prime in it. And what happens is I query the Oracle one, the Oracle says false. And then I, as the solver, can say, okay, now I know I can assume that prime one is false. And then for the rest of my solving algorithm, I, I make that assumption that prime one returns false. And then if we have, so let's look at something that generates constraints. This is in a synthesis context. So this Oracle here takes a candidate program in and it generates a constraint. Um, and the constraint is a positive witness. So what happens is if I say, hey, here's my program, x plus 1, and the oracle says Z is, Z1 is 7, Z2 is 13, I as the solver then know that a valid program, F, must satisfy F7 is equal to 13. So that's I've given you an example of an assumption and a constraint generator. That's all you need to define the, to tell the solver how, how the, what the oracles mean. But I'm going to give you one other bit of syntactic sugar. And that sugar is going to be oracle function symbols. So prime was an oracle function symbol. What I mean, what, what this is, is this is me saying, here's a symbol in my formula. It has an implementation. The implementation is like the implementation is over there in that external oracle. The behavior of this symbol is exactly the same as that oracle. So then your oracle must be functional and you must have this assumption generator in this form that is something like prime y is equal to z. So that's the component parts. I'm now going to tell you what we do when we put these in with an SMT problem. So an SMTO problem is, so we've got, a, we've got a tuple. We've got the classic set of ordinary function symbols and a formula in a background theory. And then the new things are this set of Oracle function symbols and a set of Oracle interfaces. And to make this more concrete, if we look at my maths homework again, um, so I'm looking for an assignment to F1 and F2. I have this Oracle function symbol prime, and then I have this Oracle interface O prime. And what I want to know is when is this satisfiable? Like what's a valid assignment to F1 and F2? So we make the slide a little bit cleaner. Um, so if I want to simply, I want to give you like the intuition for this before I give you the actual formula for sort of sat and unsat. So if prime does what we expect, then we know that this formula is sat, right? I know that F1 and F2, um, like I know that the prime factors of 24 exist. Um, but we don't know that prime does what we expect. It could do anything. So if we haven't called the oracle, then a valid assignment must work for all possible behaviors of prime because we know nothing about prime. We haven't called the oracle at all. As we call O prime, we get assumptions about the behavior of prime that rule out some of the behaviors. And then a satisfying assignment only, to, only needs to work for the remaining ones. And if we get enough assumptions to rule out all of the assignments, then it's unsat. So if I put, put some formula on this, it's satisfiable if, for all possible interpretations of prime, if the assumptions hold, that implies that rho, the formula, is true. And it's unsatisfiable if 
there does not exist a single interpretation of prime where the assumptions and rho are true. And it's, it's unknown otherwise. Um, so, but what about constraints? I didn't have any constraints in there. So let's, I'm gonna add some constraints now. Um, so I've got a constraint generator. And the key thing with constraints is they must be obeyed. Like a solver must obey your constraints. So then when we add those in, it's satisfiable if for all interpretations of prime, if A is true, then rho and B are true. And it's unsatisfiable if there doesn't exist a single interpretation of prime for which A, rho and B are true. And it's unknown otherwise. So you move between these statuses as you call, as you call the oracles. So you typically, you're going to start in unknown. If you haven't called any oracles, you're probably in unknown. You might, like, probably. Um, and then as you generate assumptions, you will move from unknown into sat, or you might move from unknown into unsat, um, quite intuitively. And then you can also generate constraints, and constraints might move you from unknown into unsat. So this is fine. There's a couple of weirdnesses in this. So if I generate assumptions that conflict, like say I've got a non-functional oracle, I generate assumptions that conflict with each other, then I am both sat and unsat, which is weird. Um, and also if I'm in sat and then I generate constraints, I can in fact move to unsat, which is also weird. So to get rid of this dual, like you can be in both sat and unsat, or you can change the result, um, we're going to introduce um, like a sub problem of SMTO, which I'm going to call um, definitional SMTO. And so we force, we say that all the Oracle interfaces must define Oracle functions and that there are no constraint generators. And this gets rid of both of those weirdnesses. And it's also all we need for doing synthesis with Oracles later on. Um, so solving SMTO problems, once you've defined that restricted definitional SMTO, this is quite straightforward at this point. So what we do is we have a simple loop. And um, the first thing we do is we ask a standard SMT solver if the problem is unsat. If it's unsat, we return unsat. Um, if it's sat, then we get a model. Um, and what we do is we check whether that model is consistent with the oracles. So for every oracle function symbol that appears in the model, we check whether we check whether it would be consistent with the actual underlying oracles. And if you want further details of that, um, look in the paper. And then if it is consistent, then we return sat. And if it's not, then we add these assumptions back to A and then repeat the loop. And that actually gives us enough to then be able to talk about talk about synthesis with oracles. Once we have definitional SMTO, we can start talking about how we do SIMO. And a SIMO problem is a tuple. So um, you've got a tuple of functions to synthesize. You've got a set of oracle function symbols. And then you have this formula for all x phi, where phi is quantifier free and then the set of Oracle interfaces. So this is very similar to a syntax guided synthesis problem in that you're looking for a set of, you're looking for the functions f for such that for all x phi is true. The only difference is that phi can contain Oracle function symbols and you have this set of Oracle interfaces. So making it more concrete, um, I here's an example where my formula is for all x core f and fx less than 256. Um, and core f is, so core here is an oracle function symbol. So we've got this assumption generator um, that's part of this interface. And what we want to know is we want to know when is f valid? When is a, when is a candidate solution to this, this valid? And what we're going to do is we're actually going to say f is valid if there's no x such that phi is false. So this is like our formula was for all x phi, and it's valid if there's no x such that phi is false. So that is if the SMTO problem is unset. And it's invalid if, there's a, if there is an x such that phi is false. So then if the SMTO problem that looks for 
an X, an assignment to X such that not phi is true, that if that's set, then F is invalid. Um, and so we've talked about, we've, we've now got an SMTO solver. I'm placing some restrictions on my SIMO problem that mean that I can solve this using definitional SMTO. And my, my restrictions are not that limiting. Um, I'm simply saying that all the assumption generators define Oracle function symbols and that all the oracles are functional. Um, so that's not very limiting, but I'm telling you about it now before I try and tell you about the algorithm, uh, which I'm gonna do now. Um, the key thing here is this is a unifying algorithm that will solve so we'll so we're able to solve a synthesis problem with oracles, like any oracles. We don't need to adapt the algorithm to look at new oracles, which means that this algorithm will implement things like ICE learning if you give it the correct the correct oracles. So we start off by saying by looking for a function that satisfies the constraints we've got so far. If we find that function then we pass it to the SMTO solver and we ask the SMTO solver if that's if the not phi formula is set or unset. If it's unset, we've got a solution. If it's set, then we've got these any constraints we generated. And we also make a constraint that comes from the assignment model. And we pass these back to the SMTO solver. Also, if there are any additional oracles that the SMTO solver didn't need to solve, we also pass all of this back up to the synthesis. So we're passing all of these constraints back to the synthesis, and then we repeat the loop. And the synthesis this time has to satisfy the new set of constraints. And so because F, because the candidate functions are guaranteed to satisfy B because of the way the synthesis co is constructed, the SMTO solver, solver doesn't need to consider B at all. So it's purely in definitional SMTO. And I'm going to step through an example to show you how this works. So back with my cats, um, the way I actually solved the cat problem is I built this oracle. And this oracle takes in a function which manipulates pixels. I've given you a really simple one here. It just takes a single pixel value and returns one. You can also have a function that takes in like the pixel value and the location of the pixel, which means you can do things like crop the image. Um, so it takes in that function and it returns, uh, it has a constraint generator and it has an assumption generator. And so when we're stepping through the algorithm, we start off with A and B being true. And we come up with we come up with a candidate function. And our candidate function here is probably just going to be something like return zero. We pass that to the SMTO solver. The SMTO solver looks for a satisfying assignment to not phi and it calls the oracle. The oracle loads the function, executes it and generates this assumption and this constraint. The SMTO solver then says, oh, OK, this is sat now. I can return, I, I return sat and I pass these, I pass the um, constraints upwards. So we append these to our set of A and B. And the synthesis tries again. And we get another candidate. And the oracle is called again. And we get another constraint and we get another assumption. And the SMTO solver says, oh, right, OK, this is sat again. Um, so here you are, here's some more, here's some more constraints. And the synthesis solver has another crack. And this time it comes up with, uh, 255 XORD with the input. Um, and the SMTO solver calls the Oracle and the Oracle gives back this assumption that says that core returns true on this, on 255 XORD with X. And the SMTO solver then says, oh, OK, this is now unsat. I now can't find an assignment to X such that this is sat. So then we have a solution. And we've found the function that uh, did the cat transformation. So this was sort of a toy example. But um, the point was to illustrate how the constraints and assumptions are passed around in the solver. And so we had a bit of it. We've got a prototype evaluation in the paper. And so we've constructed these benchmarks, which are available. Um, so we've got image manipulation similar to what you've seen. 
We've got control stability and control safety, which is the control example I mentioned at the beginning. We've got SMTO problems based on some sort of some maths textbooks, which again is what I mentioned at the beginning. And the final category is some programming by example, which is taken from the syntax guide synthesis competition. And we compared ourselves to CBC5, um, which is the leading, the leading Zygus solver. And so in order to do this comparison, we built these benchmarks with oracles and without. So for almost all of them, you can, you can build this benchmark without using oracles. It just involves some recursive functions or some nonlinear arithmetic. Um, for the images, we had to do an approximate model because again, we had to say, okay, assuming the compiler is correct. And so we ran this comparison um, and uh, given, given that our implementation is, is a prototype where we think this really does show the potential of being able to integrate these oracles inside your standard solver because we outperformed CVC5 on so many of the benchmarks despite, um, despite our implementation being a bit rough and ready. Um, and another thing that we did as part of this evaluation is we also have an extension of um, Cygus if. So this is the standard interchange format for syntax guided synthesis. And if you go and look at the official Cygus doc docs now, you can see that we've added these commands for defining oracles, constraints, assumptions, and also oracle function symbols, as well as some syntactic sugar for sort of common oracles you might want to use. Sort of just to conclude, like the main the main contributions of this of this work is that we've defined this these oracle interfaces, this way of communicating what oracles do with your solver, and with, this allowed us to present a unifying algorithm for SMTO and SIMO. And this algorithm perform will perform synthesis with complex oracles without you needing to build new solvers or new algorithms. And the oracles can be really almost anything. So you need to be able to say yes or no for correctness. Um, and you need something that provides sem semantic guidance to the learner. And they can be used with traditional SMT constraints. And do you have, like, what I want to say is you probably have some oracles. We want your oracles. Please talk to us. We want to take your problems with your oracles and we want to build more benchmarks. Um, yeah. Talk to us, please. And if there are any questions, please ask questions. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Elizabeth. Uh, there are some uh, uh, questions uh, by uh, in the, over here. Maybe we can start with those. And uh, in the meantime, I'll let uh, somebody check in the room. Uh, so uh, Yoni Zohar is uh, asking, uh, what are the main applications you envision for SMTO beside SI, SY, and MO? Uh, okay, so actually, I think SMTO um, has a lot of potential. So uh, one of the things that we're thinking about um, is so recent like one of the things we're thinking about is so if you have like a software model checker and your software model checker outputs stuff into smt formula like perhaps you don't need to output everything about your program as an smt formula perhaps some parts you can just turn into executables and you can turn them into oracles and you can perhaps break the problem down a little bit that way um recursive functions is also like a very good place to start looking for applications of SMTO because that's a thing that sort of SMT solvers find quite challenging and it's quite natural to try and then build an implementation of that. And hopefully that answers the question. Yep. Uh, apparently, yes. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the in-person audience? I'm checking the room. There's, uh, there's a question, yeah. So uh, it looks like we do have one, right? Um, yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, so so I, I know that um, uh, you presented the problem for uh, sort of uh, exists for all and a quantifier for this kind of Cygus format. But mm. if you had to do something like quantifier exp quantified expression synthesis, you wouldn't get example inputs. You'd get example models. And you'd like sort of meta 
constraints about the kind of formulae and the kind of models you're seeking, right? So do you expect that this Oracle-based interface would extend? Because, I mean, formulation-wise, it's a good fit, but algorithmically, do you think your solution would extend? Mm, so I think, or oh, it depends on how good the guidance is you can give to, it depends on how good the like guiding constraints are that you can give to the synthesis phase. Um, so you're right that the interfaces would extend to that. Um, I mean, the trick with, so the trick with making like the synthesis phase of any kind of Cygus good, right, is being able to give it the right kind of guidance through the search space. And it depends whether you're able to give that. I can imagine a scenario where you could try, where you tried that and it simply took too long to enumerate through the solution. So you might need to also combine it with some kind of smart syntactic guidance as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, maybe. Are there any other questions? Yeah, we have one more question. Thank you, Anderka. Uh, you mentioned the LTI systems as an application. Mm. I was wondering uh, how does it work? Uh, why do you need the synthesis? Because if you have a description of an LTI system, you already know how to how to um. construct it. Yeah. Okay. I know. I know what you're pointing. I know what you're getting at. So you can, because all your all for an LTI system, all you need to synthesize is a matrix, right? The controller is a matrix. Um, so you can also try and do this with SMTO. Like you can try and do it with um, straight, like straight SMT, where you're just looking for an assignment to the values in the matrix. Um, you still need the oracles though, because the um, the SMT solver isn't so isn't good enough to do this like eigenvalue calculation. Um, the reason we did it as a synthesis problem rather than an SMT problem is we found that when we framed it as a synthesis problem, um, it was like it seemed fairer on the non-Oracle based implementation, like the non-Oracle based implementation was able to solve some of them as synthesis problems and not as SMT problems. Okay, that is very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? We have one more question if we have the time. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a break afterwards, so we can take a few more questions. Um, um, do, do you expect the, that the, that there's an extension of this algorithm to uh, oracles that are non-monotonic? So they're not, you know, they're not, they're not perfect. I did maybe like a testing-based uh, implementation, and so with more knowledge comes better, uh, you know, uh, power for me to tell you what the function's behavior is. And so you might have to drop some of the constraints, constraints that you learned earlier. Right. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the really fun directions to go in in the future. Like if you could also give some kind of like confidence, if the oracles could give some kind of confidence waiting to like what they're telling you, and then you could like the solver could start sort of balancing that out and sort of dropping some of the things it's less confident about. Um, yeah, like that's one of the really fun directions to go in. We haven't done it yet though. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? There's one. Uh, let's have this maybe as a final question. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's make this the final question. Uh, just an interesting application. Uh, have you guys considered uh, applications of this kind of technique to decompilation, maybe in the presence of a certain like uh, black boxes and binary blobs? So, for example, like say, I don't know, I have a binary blob in the Linux kernel and I want mm. to verify that it does what it says it does. Could I somehow feed it into some kind of solver and try to generate a specification for it? Uh, this sounds a little bit similar to, so right at the beginning, I said there's some really cool use of oracles in program lifting. It sounds a little bit similar to what they've done, but like maybe not quite the same. Um, we haven't considered it. I would like to consider it. Um, maybe email me if you want to talk about it. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's uh, everything okay, from the uh, Thank you, Elizabeth, once again. And uh, now we're going to